every living creature uses energy. While some burn it in a blaze of activity, others spin it out in a leisurely fashion. But for every life form, it takes energy to get energy. This maxim extends from the behavior of whole communities to the activities of a single cell. At the molecular level, energy comes in packets of glucose. As we saw in program one, the energy of glucose must be transferred to ATP. This energy transfer happens through the process of cellular respiration. Phase one, glycolysis, initiates the release of energy from glucose. Since all organisms have similar methods of processing energy, biologists believe that most life forms have a common ancestry. While glycolysis is a complicated pathway, it can be reduced to a few essentials. Glycolysis initiates the release of energy by injecting the six carbon glucose molecule with sufficient energy to cleave it into a pair of three carbon molecules of pyruvate. In the process, two molecules of ATP are synthesized. Each reaction in glycolysis enlists the assistance of enzymes to take the reactants to products. There you have it, the bare bones. But before the process of glycolysis gets underway, glucose must be made available. In the human body, glucose is stored principally in the liver and muscles as the carbohydrate glycogen. So glycogen acts as the storehouse of glucose in the body. Upon demand, liver glycogen is broken down by enzymes into single glucose molecules, which are then transported by the circulatory system to organs and tissues. At the lipid membrane of a cell, glucose crosses through a protein tunnel and enters the cell cytosol where glycolysis will take place. While the aim of cellular respiration is to provide an accessible reservoir of energy for the cell, the first half of glycolysis actually requires the input of energy. This energy is provided by ATP, which breaks the bonds of glucose. But as we shall see, the sequence of reactions in glycolysis will eventually produce a net gain of ATP molecules. Now for the details. In the first reaction called phosphorylation, a phosphate group from one ATP is transferred to glucose, producing glucose phosphate and ADP. While half of ATP's energy was used in the reaction, the remainder is held in the energized glucose phosphate. The placement of the negatively charged phosphate group on the glucose confines glucose phosphate within the cell. In reaction two, the committed glucose phosphate encounters an enzyme and is reshaped to fructose phosphate. In reaction three, fructose phosphate reacts with a molecule of ATP producing fructose diphosphate. Up to this point, glycolysis appears to be a fairly smooth process with one reaction 
following another. Glucose consumes one ATP to form glucose phosphate, leading to fructose phosphate, and with the use of a second ATP, fructose diphosphate. While the steps seem straightforward, when we isolate the reaction of glucose phosphate to fructose phosphate, an apparent problem arises. Fructose phosphate is a highly unstable molecule that has a strong tendency to revert to glucose phosphate. Were the reaction reversible, glycolysis would grind to a halt. So, what keeps the reaction moving in one direction? The answer lies in the concept of reaction coupling. As each fructose phosphate is formed, an ATP immediately reacts to form fructose diphosphate. In this configuration, the stable fructose diphosphate does not revert to glucose phosphate. Now, like coupled boxcars, as each fructose phosphate is used, a glucose phosphate replaces it. And for each glucose phosphate used, a glucose molecule is brought into the cell. This coupling of reactions is the driving force for all of glycolysis. Let's pick up glycolysis in reaction four. The six carbon fructose diphosphate is cleaved into two distinct three carbon molecules. DHAP and PGAL. In reaction five, DHAP is converted into a second PGAL molecule. The two companion PGAL molecules now continue along the pathway. And that's it, the first half of glycolysis. Let's review the process. Glucose. Glucose phosphate. Fructose phosphate. Fructose diphosphate. DHAP and PGAL. And finally, two PGAL molecules. In summary, ATP infused more energy into the two PGAL molecules then contained in the parent glucose molecule. In the next program, we'll follow the fate of PGAL through the second half of glycolysis.